Good morning, you eights. Thank you for logging on so promptly. We've got over 50 of you already, fantastic. Just wait a bit longer for everyone to join. Wow, 106, and we haven't even got a minute into the meeting. That's absolutely fantastic, guys. Well done. Well, I'm seeing lots of little waves popping up there. Hi, guys. Lovely to see. So I can't normally, when the lesson properly begins, I won't be able to see the Q&A box, but I can see it now. And hi, guys. I'm well, thank you. I hope you all are too. Hi, Miss. I'm just going to read out the fact that all, almost all of the the um, 12 things that have been typed in the box at the moment are good morning, Miss. Hello, Miss. Hi. Good so, morning. Hello to everyone. <laughs> Lovely to have you all here. Um, OK. Right. So it's just about the numbers have just about stopped going up now. So we're going to begin. First of all, welcome. It is brilliant to be online with you all this morning. Um, I just want to start by saying how fantastically you all did last week. As a department, we were really impressed with, um, firstly, how many of you participated in both the webinar and in handing in the work so well done, and how well you got on with using all the new systems, like watching the webinar back over from YouTube, filling in the Google form, and, um, and those of you that gave the extension work a go as well. Absolutely brilliant. So really well done. Um, so let's let me begin by sharing my screen and we can begin the lesson bear with me a moment um, right okay i hope we can all see that so same as last week, you have your webinar now, which should be maximum four to five minutes, probably a little bit less. And then straight away, you'll have work in the Google Classroom. The webinar recording will be uploaded. It will not be there instantly because the recording has to be processed, but it will be up as soon as we can. And a reminder not to spend over this time on your science because getting a work balance at the moment is really important. Making sure you not don't have too much on your plate. So. Same as last week, but just to recap, we're going to watch the webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, put them in the Q&A box. Um, you don't need to memorise this webinar video or the slides. You will have access to them, and we would like you to use them when you are completing your work. It's really important you do that. Um, rather than just racing through the questions, it's much better that you take your time over it, and if you're not sure of an answer, you're using the webinar and any other resources to help you, because that's the way you'll learn the best. And it is quite clear for us to see who has taken their time and done it properly and who's just tried to get it done as quickly as possible. Um, and at the end, there will be a question and answer session as well if you don't get to ask everything during the lesson. So um, firstly, as I said, you all did brilliant last week, but I just wanted to talk about a question. So it's really good with the Google Forms. They tell us if there's a question that a lot of people got wrong. So this was one that came up. Um, however, I am aware that I think this one could have been an issue with the image. So the image was meant to be, um, the arrows were meant to be the same size, but I can see how looking carefully, you could interpret the arrows as being different sizes. So a lot of you would have put unbalanced. However, that would have marked it wrong for you. So I just want to put your mind at rest and say, I'm aware that I could have definitely chosen a better image for that, as I can see how you could interpret that as being unbalanced. But the answer was balanced, because also if you think about for a moment, what it actually means if the forces are balanced, we can see that the metal block is resting on the table, not moving. And actually, if this arrow was bigger, like it looks slightly in this image, um, the metal block would have broken through the table and fallen. Um, so I just wanted to, um, first of all, acknowledge that some of you might have been confused by the answer on that question, but it also allows us to just talk a bit more about balanced forces and what that actually means for the object. OK, so this is actually saying what would happen if the metal block was, in fact, larger force than the reaction force of the table. So as the image might appear, so it would be the metal block would break through the table and fall. 
Okay, on to today's lesson. So after the lesson, you'll be expected to complete a short Google form quiz just to check your understanding of what we covered today. We're then going to do a practical. So hopefully you have ice cubes waiting already in your freezer. If you don't, for whatever reason, that's fine. There is other work you can do. And unfortunately, if you're, if you're in school today, you also won't be able to do this um, this time. If you still have time left, there are challenge questions to do as an extension. This webinar will cover the difference between heat and temperature, the three ways heat is transferred, and the main differences between the three ways of transferring heat. Some of you may have covered some of these topics in a lesson already, which is brilliant. So this will be a bit of revision for you and a chance to ask any questions and really solidify your knowledge of this. OK, so just to get started, we've got a few questions to think about. Um, I'm going to put up a poll in a moment, but for now you can think about these. So the first one, what unit is temperature measured in? Second one, what unit is energy measured in? And a slightly longer thinking question. So what do we think is the difference between heat and temperature? So Mr. Lamb, could I have the first poll, please? See if this works. I'm very sorry, I don't actually seem to have access to the poll. That's okay, I believe, Miss. sorry, I haven't introduced you all. Mr. Lamb is on here and Miss Yavi is also on here today. So thank you very much, Miss Yavi, for getting that up. So if you all could put your answer, that is brilliant. And Mr. Lamb, I'm just gonna give you access now. Um, bear with me a moment. Wonderful. Okay, so, I'm going to end the poll there. 89% um, of you have got the answer absolutely correct. Really fantastic start, guys. It's 119 of you. The answer is degrees Celsius. Well done. OK, second poll. What unit is energy measured in? So if we could have the next poll, please, Miss Yavi or Mr. Lamb, whichever one of you. Wonderful. So same options as before. What unit is energy measured in? Nearly all answered. OK, the numbers have stopped going up. The answer is joules, which 68% of you got right. So really well done. So remembering that we show jewels with a capital J when we're just showing the symbol for it. Really excellent start, guys. Well done. Um, so onto this thinking question. We're not going to do a poll for this, but we're going to now think about the difference between heat and temperature. Oh, hold on. Okay, so we often use these words in everyday life interchangeably. You might one day talk about the um, the temperature increasing and you might another day talk about the heat increasing but actually in science there is a definite difference between these two terms so temperature is a measure of how hot or cold a substance is and we measure it in degrees celsius now this is the symbol for degrees celsius um heat is a measure of energy so heat is a type of energy um and when something is heated what you're actually measuring is a transfer of thermal energy so thermal is a word we often use to mean heat. And if we go really deep into it, thermal energy is the total kinetic energy of the particles in a substance. So if this second part of the definition confuses you, then just focus on the first part, which is that heat is a type of energy and it's measured in joules, which we can show by J. But we are gonna go into a bit more detail in the lesson about the particle level of heat. Um, so the interesting thing about heat and temperature is that um, heat can affect different materials in different ways. So different materials or substances can be given the same amount of heat energy, but the temperature change will be different. So what this means in real life, if we think back to the days when it was sunny and we might have gone to a beach, I know that seems like a very, very long time ago now. Um, so it'll be a really sunny day and you might be walking along the sand or the stones depending on what kind of beach you're on. And they'll be really, you'll notice they'll be really hot from the sun. They might even hurt your feet to walk on. And then when you reach the water, though, the water will be cold. Now, if you think about it, they've both been receiving the same 
heat energy from the sun. The sun has been heating them both equally, yet they are different temperatures. So that's why it's, re it's really important that we do distinguish between heat energy and temperature as they are quite different things. Um, the reason for this difference in temperature change is actually due to something called specific heat capacity that you don't need to know about at the moment, but you will cover it in GCSE in the future. So if you are really interested in this, feel free to research it yourselves after the lesson. Okay, so we're gonna think in particular about heat transfers. So we've already spoken about the sun um, transferring heat energy to the earth. And there's lots of other ways that heat transfers feature in our everyday lives. For example, the temperature of the sea. Don't know if any of you have been sea swimming anytime recently. It's very cold at the moment. Um, we also heat our houses, often with radiators. Hot drinks are a good example of heat transfers and also um, machines and processes such as hot air balloons involve heat transfers as well, but we're gonna speak in more detail about that later. So how is heat actually transferred? So we can see a nice example here of a just a pot over a fire, nice and simple. So when an object is heated, you're actually transferring energy to it. So energy is being transferred into its thermal energy store. Heating can take place in three different ways, and that depends on the medium. Now this word medium, what I mean by that is just material. It's just a fancy scientific word for the type of material. So we can see here in this diagram that the medium will be solid metal. But we can also talk about medium in terms of whether it's a solid liquid or gas. Um, so the three ways of transferring heat are conduction, convection and radiation. So these are our three key words for this lesson. So these are going to come up again and again to so make sure you really familiarise yourself with them. So conduction is our first type of heat transfer we're going to talk about. This might be one you may be familiar with already, as when you looked at metals in year seven, you might have thought about whether something was a good conductor of heat or whether something was a bad conductor of heat, of heat and of electricity. So just so I can check our level of understanding already on this, Mr. Lamb, could I have the next poll, please? So what states of matter do we think conduction happens in? You can select more than one answer if you want to. So we haven't done this yet, but this is just so I can get an idea of what you might already know about this. Okay, I'm going to end in three, two, and one. Okay, that's absolutely fantastic. I can see that 60% of you have got that correct, and we haven't even covered it yet. So really well done. Conduction only happens in solids. Excellent start. So in order to think about conduction, we need to visualise a solid as a series of particles particles as we can see from this diagram. So we're familiar with particle diagrams of solids. The particles are all closely packed together in a regular arrangement and they vibrate slightly. So when something is being heated, for example it appears that there's a metal block held over a Bunsen burner here, um, what happens is energy is transferred to the particles. This makes the particles vibrate more. And when they vibrate more, they actually bump into their neighbouring particles. So we call this collide. So collide or collision is like a scientific word for saying when particles bump into each other. So the um, heat, heat energy is transferred from the heat source to the particles. They vibrate more and collide with their neighbouring particles. This then makes the neighbours vibrate faster as well. And then they collide with their neighbouring particles and cause them to vibrate more as well causing like a Mexican wave transfer of energy through the solid until ultimately the entire solid is evenly heated. Um, I'd like to put up our next poll now because I want us to have a think about, based on what you now know about how conduction works, why does conduction only happen in solids? So if I could have the next poll, we can all think about that one, thank you. So why does conduction only happen in solids? I 
Okay, I'll give us five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling there. Okay, a little bit of a spread of answers, which is great. It shows me that a lot of you are really thinking about, um, really thinking about your answers. Um, the correct answer is the particles are closest together. So 55% if you've got that correct, which is brilliant. We're thinking into quite high level science here at the moment. So I'm really, really impressed with that. Um, so you're absolutely correct. Because the particles are closest together, this means that they can collide with each other when their energy increases and they vibrate more. So this isn't possible to happen if the particles are more spread out, like in a liquid or a gas. Um, so we're just going to just show you a recap of our particle diagrams, just to remind us they are solid, they are tightly packed together. So one vibrates, it's going to impact the others and going to cause them to vibrate as well, increasing the internal energy of the particles and then ultimately increasing the heat energy stores. But we can see in a gas and a liquid, the particles are more spread out, so this process can't happen. Um, so thinking about some key terms, a conductor is something that allows heat energy to pass through it. So I think we're all quite familiar with the idea that some materials are better conductors than others. For example, metals are good conductors. They allow heat energy to pass through easily. A thermal insulator does the opposite. An insulator stops heat passing through it. And you actually are quite familiar with a lot of insulators in your everyday lives. For example, a drinks cup. One of those take the um, kind of reusable drinks cup is often an insulator because um, what it wants to do is prevent any heat being lost from your hot drink. And also you can see I have a picture of somebody wearing a puffy winter jacket. So puffy jackets actually trap lots of air in and air is a really good insulator. So that prevents your body losing heat, which is what keeps you warm. On to our very exciting practical. So Miss Yavi um, has very kindly put together a brilliant video for you all, which um, shows how she carried out this practical. So you can use this to help you when you're doing your own practical. There's a practical sheet that's on your Google Classroom. You must use this as well. So you're basically gonna be testing how well different surfaces, how, how good, you're gonna be comparing how well they conduct heat. Um, you can choose a variety of surfaces. You don't have to do the same ones Miss Yavi has done, but you can do, but feel free to get more creative with the surfaces that you use. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the results. Um, if you have time to do this, I would like, oh, I didn't mean to play the video. Sorry, bear with me a moment. How do I go on to the next slide? There we go. If you have time to do this, I would like you to prevent you, present your results as a bar chart. Obviously, I'm sure you'll make your bar chart look a lot prettier than mine. Um, but this is just an example to show you. OK, on to our next method of transferring heat. So this method is called convection. And this happens in liquids and gases. So while conduction only happens in solids, Convection is how heat is transferred in liquids and gases. So we're going to look at an example of convection when a beaker of water is being heated on a Bunsen burner. Now this is something you've all done in science lessons. Um, and it's also the same process as what happens if you're heating a pan of water on the stove, for example, or maybe a pan of soup or something. So what happens is if we have this beaker of water, we can see that the particles that are closest to the heat source are going to get heated quicker. So this is in this diagram we have here, this is shown by the red. So those particles are going to get hotter. Um, I'd like us to think about what happens to particles when they are heated up. Um, Ms. Salam, could I have the next poll, please? So what happens to particles when you heat them up? There's actually two possible answers for this. So do please choose two answers. I hope I've allowed that to happen. If I haven't, I'm very sorry. Just choose one which you know is correct. Okay, I'm going to end the polling in three, two, and one. 
Absolutely fantastic. 61% of you have given one of the correct answers, which is they gain, oh, I missed them why, but you all got it anyway. They gain kinetic energy and speed up. And 21% of you have given the second correct answer, the other correct answer, which is that they get less dense. So overall, 82% of you, absolutely brilliant, well done. Um, so we know that when we heat up particles, they gain kinetic energy, they speed up, they move around faster, they move around more. And they also get less dense, which means that they spread out more. If you look at these di this diagram on the top, on the top of the slide, the green particles, we can see it shows an example of a less dense gas and a more dense gas. So density is oh, just about how close together the particles are. Um, so basically, back to our Bunsen burner example, what happens is the particles that are getting heated move around more and they spread out more, they become less dense. And if something's um, less dense, it rises above, it rises to the top of the more dense particles. So obviously, those cooler particles are going to be denser. So the hotter particles rise to the top. So we all know this concept of hot air rises. Well, this is exactly because of this, because of this, um, the fact that they get less dense as they get hotter. Um, so they rise to the top. But then as they're rising, they're actually moving away from the heat source. So then they're going to cool down, which will as you can maybe as you can maybe work out um, as they cool down it will cause them to lose energy and become more dense again so they will fall again but then when they're at the bottom they will get heated by the heat source again and this is a cycle and this cycle of moving particles and heat transfer is known as convection and this happens in liquids and in gases so if we were in a lab right now we would maybe get to do an example of looking at convection currents in a beaker using some food colouring. Unfortunately, we can't do this at the moment, but please feel free to have a look at this video. Um, oh no, I don't want to play the video. Sorry, bear with me a moment. I don't know how to stop this. Um, there we go. Um, convection currents also feature in our everyday lives. So ocean currents are partly caused by convection currents, so by differences in water temperatures around the globe. Um, there are convection currents underneath the Earth's crust. Maybe you learned about this in geography. Convection currents are also what cause air balloons to, um, to work, but we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Um, convection currents are also the reason that radiators heat your house, because what they do is they heat the air closest to the radiator first, and then um, that starts a convection current cycle. Um, okay, moving on to, well, sorry, going back to hot air balloons. This is a great video showing how somebody has made a hot air balloon in a lab by heating up um, the particles directly underneath the hot air balloon, which is a plastic bag, using a hairdryer. I must really, really stress, do not try this at home. Hair dryers can very easily set on fire especially if they're not being used in the way they were designed for. Um, if you are with a responsible adult um, and they want to try this with you, obviously that's fine, that's up to them. But I'm just gonna stress again, do not try this yourselves at home. It is potentially very dangerous, but do watch the video. It's fun and interesting. Right, on to, oh, every time I try and do the next slide, I accidentally, the video. Great. Okay, um, our very own Miss Garvey has made a brilliant video to tell you more about the scientific process behind convection. If you want a little bit more information of that or you thought my explanation was a bit brief, please do take a look at that. Okay, we are on to the third and final method of heat transfer. I'm aware we've given you guys a lot of information today, but remember you will be able to watch this webinar back over and use it to help you with your work and your practical. So Radiation um, is our final heat transfer. So this is where heat is transferred by something called infrared radiation. Now convection and conduction both involve particles. So we remember that in conduction, the particles gain energy and they pass that energy onto other particles. And in convection, the particles themselves move around. But radiation is even more different to those two because it actually doesn't involve any particles. Infrared radiation is an electromagnetic wave. Some of you will have already looked at the electromagnetic spectrum of your teacher. 
Um, so you'll know about these. Some of you won't have yet, but that's okay because you will in the future. Um, but all you need to know is that it's a wave, just in the same way that we have sound waves and radio waves and light waves. Um, and it doesn't need particles to pass through. So because of this, this is actually how we get heat energy from the sun, because we know that a lot of space is a vacuum, meaning it doesn't have particles. So the, um, the sun's heat energy reaches us via radiation, which is pretty clever. Um, moving on. So again, to go into a bit more depth on radiation, Miss Sylvia has given us a video that you can watch in your own time. If there's anything that you weren't entirely clear on with that. I'm sorry, bear with me a moment. So radiation is actually what's involved in thermal imaging cameras. So every object emits radiation, every single one, but some objects emit more radiation than others. Um, so thermal imaging cameras actually detect the amount of radiation something emits and uses that to make images, which is a pretty good, pretty good way of doing it and pretty fun fact. So we're going to think for a moment about radiators because radiators are actually um, named in a quite confusing way. Um, so I believe that there is another poll on this. So how do radiators transfer heat to the environment? We could just get the next one up, that would be great. So, how do radiators primarily heat a room? Okay, 85 of you voted already, absolutely brilliant. You're all clearly paying lots of attention and very switched on this webinar, which is fantastic. Okay, three, two, and one. Well done, guys. So this is a really interesting question because um, actually it uses a little bit of all three. So it emits radiation because it's an object and all objects do. Um, there's a little bit of conduction that's involved in the metal that's on the radiators, but actually convection is the main way that it heats the room. So as I explained before, it heats the air particles that are directly around it. They then gain energy, spread out more and move away. They're replaced by cooler particles and the cycle continues. Um, but it's kind of like a, it's kind of a confusing name because we assume that radiators are going to primarily heat by radiation. So um, it's important not to get caught out with that. But really well done, guys. The majority of you got that absolutely correct, 48%. Um, oh, and there is, so, so I'm just trying to get rid of this poll. So that comes to the end of the new information for this lesson. So I would like you to, we're just gonna do another quick knowledge check with another poll, just to kind of see what we remember from this webinar so far, so I can go ahead and have the next one, please. So just to remind us what type of heat transfer happens in solids, so thinking back to the beginning of the webinar. Okay, three, two, and one. Okay, absolutely fantastic. Once again, as always, 78% um, of you have got that correct, really well remembered. The answer to that is conduction. Now, if you didn't get this right, that's absolutely fine because you're gonna have access to this webinar, to watch again and again until then, um, if there's anything you need reminding of. So don't worry, but 78% of you have got that right really really well done and even those of you that didn't really well done for giving it a go and practicing using my new terminology um on our next slide is something for you to refer to it's a summary of the differences between the three different types of heat transfers so it's like a kind of three-part venn diagram so this overlap here means that it applies to both convection and conduction the middle overlap applies to all three 
think you get the gist. So please do refer to this if you need a helpful summary. Um, we're going to have a quick think about how this applies to science in the real world. So when it comes to something like building a house or insulating a house, um, people really have to consider these three heat transfers because we obviously don't want heat to be lost from our houses because it means that then um, we have to use more heating, use more energy, which costs a lot. And it also means not that nice an environment to live in if it's cold. Um, so heat can be lost through conduction, through windows, walls and roofs, because glass is um, also a conductor and our glass windows cause, um, can cause heat to be lost. Um, convection, so any air spaces or drafts in the house can cause heat loss by convection. And radiation, um, heat can also be lost by radiation through the walls, windows and roofs. So when people are designing a house or upgrading a house, they really need to think about how they can minimise heat loss through these. For example, thinking about which materials are poor conductors, so aren't going to lose heat, and by blocking off air spaces and drafts to prevent heat loss by convection. Okay, so the main takeaways from this webinar, once again, really, really well done for your focus and engagement during this. This is a lot of information, more information than the last webinar, but you've all coped with it really well. And remembering you will have access to this webinar and we'd like you to use it afterwards in that extra 45 minutes you have now. Oh, let me just go back a moment. So heat is a type of energy. Temperature is a measurement of how hot or cold something is. When we heat something up, we are transferring heat energy to it, which then does increase the kinetic energy. But what we're talking about with heat is energy transfers. Heat can be transferred by conduction in solids, convection in liquids and gases, and radiation, which is an electromagnetic wave. So just a reminder, your work for this week, you will complete the Google form quiz. Shouldn't take you very long at all. Um, I think it's not even 10 questions this time, because what we really want you to do is focus your time and energy on these practical, on this practical, so using the practical video, using the practical resource sheet to help you. Any questions, email your teacher or me or Miss Yarby. Um, if you still have plenty of time and you're raring to go for more science, there are extension challenge questions that will also be posted on the classroom. Um, so now we have a little bit of time left for any questions to be asked. So just type them in the chat box. Hello, Miss. The question that's come up the most is, so what is the practical? Um, and do we have to do it? Um, yes, the practical is your, it's part of your set work for today. So as I said, the Google form shouldn't take you very long. Um, obviously, if it does, for whatever reason, take up the entire time, um, that's fine. Um, we obviously don't want you to spend over your allocated time for science. Also, if you don't have access to ice cubes, that is also fine. So we did put a reminder in your Google Classrooms, but maybe you don't have the ice cream um, pockets to make them. That is also fine. You can instead do the challenge questions. But we thought it would be really nice to make this an activity where you guys can get away from your computer for a minute and do something a bit more practical um, and also to improve your practical skills. Um, so, yes, if it is possible, we would like you to do this. And if you can, if you'd like to upload any pictures of your practical setup to your Ontario classroom, please do. We would love to see that. So everything will be explained in the video um, that Miss Yavi has made. It's in the slides. But just so you know now, all it involves is some ice cubes and something to time and surfaces. But that can literally be the table, the floor, a chopping board, as Miss Yavi used. I hope that's clear. We've also got quite a few people said I haven't got any ice. Um, obviously, Miss has just covered that. That obviously, if you don't actually have any ice, then um, that's going to be have to be something that you skip and do um, the quiz and some of the questions instead. Mm -hmm. So we will for next week. We'll try and get tell you a couple of days in advance if you've got another practical and what it is you need, so you have time to get that ready. We did tell you yesterday, but maybe that was a bit late. And also, if you do want to put ice cubes in now and then do the practical later in the day. It's also fine. Um, don't have any other questions relating directly to it, Miss. I'm just typing some answers to a couple of them. Mm -hmm. No problem. Okay, well, 
we'll just, I'll give another minute for Miss Lam and Miss Yavi to finish answering any questions, typing them to you. But um, really, really well done today, guys. Thank you for your participation and your engagement. Feel free to log off and leave the webinar if you don't have any more questions. And I really look forward to seeing your work and seeing you all next week. I think we've covered all of the questions now, Miss. Great. Okay, then I will close the webinar. So well done again, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>